The Red Pill was one of the most polarising documentaries of recent years. It showed self-described feminist Cassie J going inside the men's rights movement in the US, where she changes her mind about feminism. The conversation is being silenced. For a society to accept anything said on behalf of women's rights, and then to shame any dialogue about men's rights and call it hate speech is precisely the problem. I don't know where I'm headed, but I know what I left behind. I no longer call myself a feminist. A word of mouth hit. It also provoked protests, some extremely critical reviews, and was even banned from some cinemas in Australia. So you brought out the red pill, is it two years, three years ago now? Yeah, two, two years. And so there's one thing, there's the film itself, and I'd love to talk to you about that and your journey about making it. And then there's another thing, which is the reaction to the film. Why I'm really interested in that is that it shows a lot about the cultural moment that we're in. When I watched the film as a filmmaker, I, I had a, a slight suspicion or just I, I wondered like how authentic the journey was because it, it was very, like it, the narrative was, was, was sort of very powerful. You, you came in as a, as a feminist and then were, were sort of, your mind was changed by the stories that you heard and you came out with a very different experience. Yeah. And I, we interviewed Warren Farrell recently in, in America and I sort of said that to him. I was like, well, you know Cassie and how, how authentic was that journey? And he said, no, it's completely authentic and told me a little bit about the backstory of what you were telling him as you were going through it. Um, so I'd love to hear more about that journey that you went through in making it. Well, I appreciate you being honest that you're skeptical of, is this girl for real? Was she really a feminist? And then started to question her beliefs after talking to men's rights activists. And I, I think I would have had the same reaction if I didn't make the Red Pill movie and I watched it as a feminist. I think I would have been very skeptical. Well, first of all, I don't know if I would have watched the Red Pill movie seeing how the media was talking about the film. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely would have been skeptical because it is such a sensational idea for a story, for a documentary, and it's almost too strange to be true. Um, but yeah, it was actually kind of a suicide mission for me where I had 100 hours of footage after filming men's rights activists for a year, and but working on the film for three and a half years. and. I, I knew the journey that I went on was going to make me extremely vulnerable and open to critique and debate and, um, and probably a lot of people would question, you know, who am I and, and am I true in, in my video diaries and in my interviews and all that. And even men's rights activists were questioning me as a documentary filmmaker going in to interview them. So really everyone was wondering, is this chick for real? Um, so, yeah, I knew in making the film there was going to be a lot of skepticism about me and I, I just figured, well, I have to put it out there and whatever happens, happens. And I, I say it was a suicide mission because if it completely flopped and failed knowing that I, I put the raw, real journey out there, then as well as having uh, the stigma now against my name being a part of this highly controversial topic for a film. I would have to go into hiding and, and I resolve that in my head as well. I can just um, become a mother. I, I'm already a hermit anyways and I'm a homebody. So uh, I, I was willing to take that risk and, and luckily uh, the film really resonated with a lot of people around the world. So I'm, I'm glad I took that risk. Could you describe that journey um, of what you went through? What were your intentions going into it? What happened during it and, and where did you end up? Uh, well, my attentions going into it were, I mean, it talks a little bit about it in the film. I, I was looking into the rape culture topic for a documentary, and what really made me decide not to do a film about that was because it was so depressing when I started looking into the stories that I could cover, and I, I didn't know if I could put years of my mental headspace into that topic. But when, when I was trying to figure out the cause of the feminist view of rape culture, I was pointed towards the men's rights movement. And at the time, A Voice for Men, this online hub of men's rights activists, was the largest and fastest growing men's rights movement online. And there were 
definitely the most controversial with Paul Elam uh, being the provocateur of the movement. And I thought, well, this is interesting. And I, I researched and found that no one had ever made a film on the men's rights movement before. It was fairly a, a young movement still. So I thought I was going to be the first. And it was going to be a shocking piece. And it would be a feminist going undercover into this uh, misogynistic world. And I would expose them for who they really are. And, uh, and really, that's what I thought the film was going to become. And sure enough, as I started interviewing men's rights activists, I knew that that idea that I had of men's rights activists was not the truth of who they really were and what they cared about or why they were part of the men's rights movement. And so then I had to uh, put my own agenda aside and really start to listen to what they had to say and why they care about this movement and, and ask myself, is there still a story here? Um, and there were definitely moments while I was filming and editing, I was wondering, well, who's going to care about, you know, fathers' rights and suicide rates and male victims of domestic violence? Do we really have, of all the issues in the world, is this worth someone's two hours of their time to watch a documentary? And the more I really started to dig into it, I realized this is a huge pervasive issue all throughout the world with uh, gender relations and, and what's happening for men opting out of marriage and, you know, the MGTOW movement and um, feminism kind of dominating the, the pop culture and the media. And, and obviously I began to see that with the release of the film. Uh, so I didn't know quite the extent until the film was released how much um, the average person's view of gender politics is really the the feminist ideology of gender politics. Um, so I, and, and I think what really intrigued me was how, when I started to realize how biased I was against men's issues and my knee jerk reaction to wanting to dismiss them or victim blame uh, male victims of domestic violence, for instance, I, I realized that, wow, this is a lot deeper than, than I thought. I really do appreciate that you told me that you're skeptical of my journey making the film and whether or not it was a scripted plan for sensationalism. And, um, you know, even if I never made the Red Pill movie and I just went on the journey of filming all these men's rights activists and questioning my own beliefs, I, I really do believe that I benefited from going, going on that journey, especially in my own relationship, uh, and also understanding my father figures and male friends better. Um, I think I could have been more private about my evolved views and maybe that would have saved me some stress over the past few years. Uh, but because I, I chose to take my transformation public and show it in, in this film, it, it really kind of, you know, I guess I asked to be uh, on the stage for stones to be thrown and um, I am glad that I did it. Uh, I hope, I know that it helped a lot of people uh, making this film and, and um, but I don't think it's, I don't think we're anywhere near where we need to be. And I, I think the Red Pill movie was just a very early kind of icebreaker into these conversations, but I think we have a long way to go with gender relations and, um, and hopefully eventually finding a healthier relationship between the genders, but mostly for children. Uh, a lot of men's rights activists I'm hearing are becoming very anti-marriage and kind of in the sense that MGTOWs, men going their own way, are anti-marriage. A lot of men's rights activists are also moving in that direction because they believe um, the institution of marriage is so corrupt and divorce courts are so corrupt that they don't want to engage in, all, in it at all. And the, the danger in that is uh, children, because I, I think where men's rights activists don't, are contradictory in their views is if they're anti-marriage, but they also stress the importance of present father figures, father to child connection. Um, you need marriage to strengthen that relationship and men's rights activists have done a lot of work and even non-men's rights activists have done a lot of work in showing the importance of present father figures uh, and the danger of single mothers. Um, and I, I would like to see 
um, marriage valued and, and looked at from a scientific standpoint of building a healthy society rather than from a religious uh, origin because I, I'm not religious and I wouldn't even call myself a traditionalist. Um, but I, I do think marriage is uh, a very important part of the backbone of our society for children. So I think we need to look in that direction and, and hope to move in that, in that direction. You kind of had your focus on gender issues just before the Me Too movement mm -hmm. started. Yeah. But in a way, you took precisely the opposite perspective to, to where the culture was going. In hindsight, yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, the Me Too movement uh, really got traction a few months after the film's release, so uh, there was no way I could know that that was going to be um, the parallel uh, media story along with the Red Pills release. So that was interesting, and I would have loved to have commented on that movement if I knew that was going to be coming. Your background, I mean, we talked a little bit before the cameras were rolling, and you sort of described yourself as you live in California, you're you're a liberal, I mean, can you sort of sketch out where you're from and, and, and what your personal sort of background is? Sure. Uh, well, I live in the San Francisco Bay Area. Sorry, I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I grew up in Seattle. I went to high school in Las Vegas. I lived in Los Angeles for about five years um, in the film industry, pursuing acting at the time. I, I never really made it. I was a horrible actress. Um, but I, I did a lot of horror films in uh, LA before moving up to the Bay Area to continue documentary filmmaking. And um, I grew up fairly uh, radical, evangelical Christian, and now I consider myself agnostic. Um, but I, I left the church around my late teens, around 20, and around that time as I was leaving the church I was also becoming a feminist and, and that was when social media was kind of really taking off around 2005, 6, 7 and I think social media had a lot to do with me becoming a feminist um, just seeing those little info memes and getting sound bites of uh, you know the pay gap which at the time I, I was eating up and believing and, and uh, so I I became an online feminist and, and uh, for about 10 years I was a feminist before I started making the Red Pill movie. And you, at the end of the film, you say you no longer consider yourself a feminist. Mm -hmm. um, how, what, what did you mean by that and how would you describe w what it means to say that? <sighs> well, that, that was definitely one of the biggest question marks uh, in my whole journey making the film was do I keep the label feminist and try to work within the movement to make it more inclusive of men's issues? Uh, because after learning about all these issues, there's no way to then walk through the world ignoring that they exist. I mean, making the film and probably for viewers watching the film, you can never see the world the same way again. Um, so I thought, do I keep the title or the label feminist to try to work within the movement, kind of like a Christina Hoff Summers, the factual feminist, and of course, you know, I've seen with her that it, it doesn't matter if she calls herself a feminist, the, the mainstream press will say what they want of her and, and feminists will uh, disown her and, and say you're not with us. Uh, so I realized I'm just one person in my late 20s at the time. Uh, I don't think I have the power to work within a very giant, uh, highly funded movement to try to make it more inclusive of men's issues. And uh, so I decided to drop the label feminist. Um, I think that's a good question. Why? I mean, I think I also I think I wanted to see how people would would react. I live in the Bay Area, where all my friends and family consider themselves feminist, and it's kind of a a given. I mean, the the idea is that if you're for gender equality, then you're a feminist, and it's you can't have one without the other. And uh, so, but I knew that they were labeling themselves feminists based on, you know, what they're reading in mostly liberal publications. And, uh, and so I thought, well, if I make the Red Pill movie and I share it with them, because really in a one dinner conversation, I cannot explain to them the journey I went on. So hopefully I can make a film to at least be an icebreaker to these conversations. And it did open 
a lot of their eyes and minds to considering men's issues, but still many of them remained feminist identifying. Um, but some of them have gone on their own kind of rabbit hole journey after watching the film and, and started to see some of the male bashing by feminist scholars or educators or the media and started to question, well, is feminism really the movement, the one and only movement for gender equality? And, uh, you know, personally for me, I would want to be a part of a movement for gender equality that includes men and boys in, in the discussion. And I think the first step is to raising awareness about these issues, which feminism is not doing. Um, so I dropped the label feminist. I'm not a men's rights activist at all. Um, I understand their movement and sympathize with their cause. I think what they're doing is valuable today. I don't know. I, I hope it won't be necessary 15, 20, 50 years from now. But right now, I think it is necessary to have this counterbalance in the gender political discussion. Uh, but I'm not a, a men's rights activist. So. And what was the reaction among your friends and kind of your immediate circle? Did you have any pushback or did you lose any friends? I lost some friends in, in a fade out kind of way where they, they heard about the red pill or they saw my name printed and, and didn't like what they read and thought that I'd become some crazy uh, right winger or something, which I'm not. I'm still a registered Democrat and, and I consider myself a liberal. Um, but I've been printed alongside White, white supremacists and nationalists, and uh, you know, if I read that about some one of my friends a few years ago, back when I was a feminist, I would have been alarmed too, and thought, well, someone went off the deep end, went crazy, you know, put them in a padded room, and I think that's what many of my friends thought happened to me. When we spoke to Warren Farrell uh, in America recently, he said that you came to him and said, "Oh, are people going to turn against me?" And he said, "Yes, they are." And at the time, you were like, oh, I was looking for some reassurance, and you're, you're not giving it to me. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, a lot of the men's rights activists, and I, I don't think Warren Farrell, Farrell considers himself a men's rights activist, but, uh, but a lot of the people I talked to during making the Red Pill movie did warn me that I, it would be career suicide, that I would lose friends and colleagues. And, and at the time, I thought they were being overly dramatic. and. Uh, I, I just thought the whole movement was uh, had all these conspiracies that were unrealistic and maybe wanting to you know get the own, their movement riled up to excite people or, or feel like they were part of some underground uh, secret society. And so I, I really kind of brushed it off and didn't think much of it, but sure enough, years later, um, a lot of their premonitions were correct. What, what do you make of the media response? Because I've, I've sort of looked online and quite a few, there's some really harsh criticisms of the film, sort of, um, especially from some of the sort of more maybe millennial outfits like Vox and um, Vice and all of those people. I maybe put some quotes on, on screen here, but what did you make of that response? Uh, I mean, it was really hard at the time. Uh, you know, I'm. I, I take a lot of things, you know, personally. I'm a fairly sensitive person and, you know, emotional at times. And so whenever an article is published that's scathing of me or the film based on misinformation, it's infuriating to me um, because I, it's obvious they didn't do their due diligence as a journalist to really research. And, and I know the how the snowball started and, and then saw it rolling down the hill and it started with our very first review of the Red Pill movie and the Village Voice based on uh, a radical feminist blogger's blog and the misinformation he posted about me and the men's rights movement and so that is what had everything spiral out of control and, and how the, the Red Pill was publicized and all the petitions against the film and the justifications for banning the film in Australia and Canada were all based on these lies. And it just uh, made me lose a lot of faith in the media um, and also, you know, social media and uh, the power and, and um, danger of groupthink and thought police. And, uh, and I, I 
and I also acknowledge that I used to be a part of that um, and how easily I could have fallen into that had I never made this film myself. And I, I don't know if anyone else would have made the film. I would like to think someone out there is going to be making more films about these topics because I think they need to be talked about. Um, but if I never made the Red Pill movie, I would have been right alongside those other feminists trying to ban this film and based on misinformation. Um, were there any of the criticisms of the film that you think were justified? Hmm, that's a very good question. Of course, the, you know, my argument is time constraints is very, you know, there's only so much you can do with what I was aiming for. An hour and a half long film became two hours, so I was already stretching it kind of long, but there's never enough time to include everything. And, and one of, I think one criticism that I would give credit to is um, how the Red Pill movie portrays feminism and it wasn't a you know malicious intentional effort to you know make feminism look any kind of way i actually think i have far more uh rational and level-headed feminists but most people going to the movie theater to watch the red pill only remember big red with the bright red hair and so they think that's the only discussion of feminism is her as the um as the the front of the movement and I didn't see it that way. I think she's just very memorable, but I, I don't think that's the, you know, of all the content included in the film, there's a lot of other scholars that are feminists that talk about their views on the men's rights movement and feminism. But I, I also didn't see the need to have a whole history lesson on feminism because there are, for my one Red Pill movie documentary, there's a thousand or more feminist documentaries that you can watch on the same online platforms. So to take up time, to take up time from the one and only documentary on the men's rights movement to date, uh, to take time out of that to discuss the history of feminism, I, I think would have been stolen time. So the criticism was that it was a caricature of feminism because it was mainly through this character of Big Red. Is that, is that what was? Yeah, there was criticism that feminism wasn't portrayed in uh, a positive light that that more level-headed feminists would have liked to see. Um, but, you know, we did have the executive editor of Ms. Magazine, who's certainly very powerful in the, in the Feminist Majority Foundation and, and in universities nationwide. Michael Kimmel is a very influential feminist author. Michael Mesner is a gender studies professor uh, at USC. And, um, you know, I had feminist friends included in the film, so protesters as well. Of course, Big Red had to be in there because she was the only feminist that had a run-in with men's rights activists face to face. And so it was a kind of a historical milestone for the men's rights movement to have this one and only interaction between feminists and men's rights activists at an event. So it had to be included. And I was lucky enough to get an interview with her. So, um, you know, I also got criticism for including Paul Elam in the film, uh, which if I didn't include Paul Elam in the film, I, I would see that as a valid criticism because he's the most known men's rights activist, at least at the time when I was filming. And why wouldn't you go to the source of all the controversy? And uh, so there, there's even student groups who have screened the Red Pill movie and then have been banned from pride parades and participating in other events just because they screened the Red Pill movie, which had Paul Elam in it. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't the movie itself that was the problem, but the fact that Paul Elam was in the film was the problem. Mm -hmm. So there's just no way to win is the thing. Um, you know, I maybe eventually there will be a, a sequel, who knows, uh, or another filmmaker I hope will be interested in tackling the men's rights movement and they can do their own treatment of how they uh, lay the issues out there or, or the members. Um, but, you know, it's, it's good to critique films, though, because that's, that's what you want as a filmmaker is conversation. So. Do you think with, with Paul E. Lamb you could have been a little bit more hard on him? I mean, my sense watching the film was that, as you, you just said before, you're not really a confrontational kind of person. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, I'm a journalist, so I'm kind of used to a, a more kind of confrontational style of interviewing, not that I particularly enjoy doing it that way myself, but yeah. um, like I, I did come away thinking you didn't maybe ask some hard questions to Paul Elam, but, but 
but I, I got the sense that was your interviewing style. You didn't really ask, put, you didn't really put anyone on the spot on either side. Um, and I, uh, but I guess that was, and I, I know now that you weren't even sure, like while you were gathering the interview, you hadn't really made up your mind about what you thought about any of them. You were still in that process. Well, I think it's good to distinguish between a Barbara Walters type interview and a documentary. And my history in documentary filmmaking has actually been fly on the wall. And so rarely, if ever, my, my voice is ever heard in the film. Uh, so The Red Pill was the first film I ever included myself in the film at all, in, including as a narrator and also asking a few questions. But very few questions that I asked my interview subjects were included in the final film itself. So for people who criticize that I didn't ask harder hitting questions to Paul Elam or to Feminists or to, to Big Red, um, I d you know, all the questions that I did ask them in my two to five hour long interviews were cut out except for maybe one question. So to criticize the questions I asked is, you know, a hundred questions I asked them, one's shown in the film. Uh, I think you have to acknowledge the format of a documentary, especially when it's more um, fly on the wall. But, uh, you know, it's, I did release a lot of the raw footage of the Red Pill movie, so I released it on YouTube for free for people to watch to see if I edited anything out of context or tried to manipulate uh, the way someone was portrayed. And I think that really helped in showing that I did not have uh, creative manipulation in my editing style. Um, so if anyone is wondering if, if I was hard-hitting enough to Paul Elam or anyone else, they can watch the raw files. Um, so, yeah, but as far as being more confrontational, uh, I think I was fairly confrontational in the raw files. It's just a matter of if it made it into the final film. Because of all the, the, the people in the film, the one that, that people do keep coming back to is Paul Elam. Mm -hmm. And there are some things that he said, like, I find really difficult online. Like, I've got a lot of sympathy oh, with... Yeah. With, with the men's rights um, perspective, that it is something that's not really seen or part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. But when I see him saying things like, I would definitely let off a, and I would never find someone guilty in a rape trial, for example, mm -hmm. I just think this, yeah. this is kind of difficult to defend. Yeah, and you know, I could have I gone through all the cherry pick comments that are used to, uh, against Paul Elam and A Voice for Men. Uh, and I think that would be a film I wouldn't want to watch because it'd be really boring. I, th I think it's a valid piece to put on online if people are really interested, although I think the people who need to hear it wouldn't sit through two hours of just listening to uh, rebuttals of the cherry pick comments because the context of what's Paul, what Paul is saying about uh, if he were on a rape trial, he would vote to acquit the, the male that's accused no matter the evidence presented. That entire article that he wrote was, was really uh, interesting food for thought. And I, I do recommend anyone who you know, thinks that's a horrible comment to read the entire article. And, and no doubt he's you know, angry in, in the way he's explaining his point and he's reacting from that anger and also trying to incite anger in the reader. Um, but you know, I think the, the criticisms of Paul uh, Whenever I watch feminist documentaries, I don't see those criticisms of, well, what about when Gloria Steinem said this in 1995? Or what about when Hillary Clinton said this in 1992? Um, you know, the, the media doesn't take the same kind of um, uh, just, what's the word I'm looking for? They're, they're not as thorough in looking at every uh, comment that they've said that could be taken offensively and asking the filmmaker why didn't you say when Hillary Clinton said that the biggest victims of war are women and children who lose their husbands and sons um, you know that that does sound like a horrible soundbite and maybe that should be looked at in feminist documentaries so um, you know, and then the, the fish and bicycle comment by well Gloria Steinem was quoting someone else but she repeated it um, so, you know, the, there was a hashtag kill all men uh, on Twitter that was going around and being supported by feminist scholars and universities. Uh, you know, so I didn't bring up those 
in the Red Pill documentary. And because if we, if we just want to sound, uh, cherry pick sound bites and analyze those, we could have a 10 hour film that I think would be hard to sit through. Um, so I, I tried to make it more about the ideas and the issues and uh, an interesting journey for the audience to go on. And there is also this paradox of you being criticized by male journalists as a betrayal of, of, of women, mm. which I've seen a few of my, my female friends who, who have a slightly different take on uh, feminism are often accused by, by men of letting themselves into either internalized misogyny or some kind of, um, yeah, there's, there's this weird paradox of, okay, so as a man, you are devaluing my experience as a woman by telling me that I'm that I've got the wrong views. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's this sort of weird paradox, Catch-22, that it seems that, okay, are, are you not doing exactly the thing that you're accusing me of doing by invalidating my experience as a woman? Yes, I, yes, I don't think I could put it better than that, but exactly. Uh, yeah, and you know, I, I have had a lot of, uh, you know, experiences as a woman that I felt I was mistreated as a woman. And that's why I became a feminist, uh, you know, now 15 years ago. Um, so, I, you know, a lot of feminists would like to criticize me saying that I, I've been in this bubble where I've only looked at the men's rights movement and I didn't look closely enough at feminism, but I, I did. I mean, I was a feminist and never heard about the men's rights movement for 10 years and that was the literature I read and the blogs I read. But even the experiences I had before coming, becoming a feminist, I, I know the struggles that women face, absolutely, um, you know, more more than I think a lot of people would realize because I, you know, do try to maintain a, a level of privacy. Um, so, I, yeah, I mean, for any male journalist to, to think that I, I am betraying all women and that I uh, am engaging in wrong think um, and, and not, uh, you know, believing women's stories or, or I, I don't even know. I, yeah, I, I don't even know how to respond to people like that because, um, yeah, I've lived through a lot, so. And do you ever ask yourself that question? Have I internalized misogyny? Have I, am I letting, letting my sisters down, any of that? Hmm. Have I let my sisters down? Well, one of the, one of the hardest parts about releasing the film was I felt a loss of sisterhood um, and you know I'm not a men's rights activist and I, of the women I've met in the men's rights movement I, I don't feel like I'm a part of a sisterhood um, so I haven't found a sisterhood since taking away the label feminist uh, from myself I, I don't feel like I fit into any kind of sisterhood group now um, you know, I met some women, and a lot of them would call themselves egalitarian or equalist or humanist, and I think I am close to, to the way they think. But, uh, but there's not the same kind of camaraderie that I experienced in feminism, and I, I don't think I let the sisterhood down because I think there are plenty of people who are fighting for valid women's rights. Uh, you know, sex trafficking and maternity leave and, you know, a lot of issues that I do want to see addressed and people are talking about them and having conferences for them. So I know that work is being done and I'm not preventing that work from being done. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think in the, the way that I am helping the sisterhood is possibly in relationships. Um, I think the women who have watched the Red Pill movie, who were self-identifying feminists, have really benefited from opening their eyes to men's issues and seeing their own male relationships in new light. And uh, so, you know, I think I have done a lot for women. Another criticism that people have of the film is sort of, why are you showing all of these angry guys? You know, that's why a lot of feminists become feminists, is, is they've had some personal experience that enrages them and possibly rightfully so. Um, you know, there is, I think when people are really involved in gender politics or a movement on any side of the fence, usually it's, it's coming from a very personal place, maybe even a place that is too hard for them to talk about and discuss. So all you're seeing is the, the bubbles on the surface of what's boiling underneath. And, uh, you know, I, I think 
to write off uh, activists as just angry whiners or uh, you know crybabies or for men's rights activists that they need a man up or something like that. Um, you know, it, it actually just kind of justifies what or it validates and supports what they're saying is that we we do have this resistance to having compassion for men and men's issues and uh, you know even right now the men's rights movement is debating whether they should take men's rights out of their title and because uh, it's been smeared so much in the media that they're and the hearing men's rights makes people scoff and laugh and and so they're wondering, should we rebrand it as a, a gender equality movement or something like that? And I think that's very telling as well, that uh, just even having the word men in a men's group or a men's forum or any, any kind of organization with the word men in it is uh, already at a disadvantage and, and is open to you know, being fired at. And uh, so, you know, I think that's worth, looking into and thinking about that um, why why is our society so willing to make men, men the butt of all jokes and that's acceptable and uh, you know for truly for gender equality shouldn't we care about all genders the me too moment happened very soon after releasing the film mm -hmm. what did you personally make of that oh well the me too movement did you post is... me too were you no, I didn't. Um, I think I think it's good that the movement started. Um, if it helped a lot of women open up about their their story and and their issues and feel more um, accepted and embraced and speaking about those stories with their friends or family, um, I think. The danger of the movement is in the language and identifying only female victims and male perpetrators. Uh, and when there have been people who've come forward wanting to participate in the hashtag MeToo movement as a male victim or accusing a female perpetrator, um, I think you know there's been a lot of uh, disappointing you know reactions to that where they are not openly embraced and, and given the same kind of treatment as a female victim with a male perpetrator is given. So I, I think, you know, dis discussing these issues is really important and, and I've, you know, um, sexual assault and harassment was definitely one of the issues that made me a feminist. So I have a, a, a big soft spot for that issue and, and even my first documentary called Daddy I Do about sex education largely talked about sexual assault and abuse and rape and um, you know these horrible stories that I, I know have been going on far longer than the Me Too movement has come out. So you know I know it's prevalent. And it sort of increasingly feels like the, the culture at large is a kind of dysfunctional relationship between men and women. Mm -hmm. Like through the Me Too movement, the Time's Up movement, the so that certainly the, the Trump-Hillary election just looked like a kind of, yeah, these gender dynamics were sort of playing out on the wider stage. Mm -hmm. um, so my, my question is, what does the space on the other side of that look like? And in a way, what I, I guess, like we talked about this with Warren Farrell in my interview with him, it's like what seems to be needed is a kind of almost like relationship counselling on a, on a wide cultural scales like how do how do you resolve this debate do you have a sense of what the space on the other side of these this yeah. dynamic looks like i think the best way for me to explain my view on that is to bring it down to a, a very small uh experience which is my relationship with my now husband of about four weeks uh we've been together seven years and the last five years i've been working on the red pill movie uh, so he's seen me through quite a transition. Um, what really worked for our relationship was the first two years of our relationship, I was very much in, in the feminist mindset and I did, and I, I'm not saying this is all feminist and I'm not trying to, you know, um, put down feminists by saying what kind of feminist I was, but 
I did most of the talking and he did most of the listening and my moods really set the stage for how home life was going to be. Uh, so if I was happy, as I say, happy wife, happy life, uh, that was pretty much the case. I, I did the complaining and he did the resolving and I had a lot to complain about and mostly it was uh, housework and uh, what I thought were roles uh, put on me by the patriarchy, the expected gender roles of doing the dishes and the laundry and cleaning, even though we're both working roughly the same amount of hours, I may work an eight hour day and he would work an 11 or 12 hour day. But we get home and, and it was, uh, I thought, expected that I would have dinner ready and the house clean. And I really resented that. Uh, but he was also paying most of the bills uh, because he did make more money and I saw that as another uh, effect of the patriarchy. And you know, I did believe in the pay gap uh, as being discrimination against women at the time. I no longer believe that to be um, you know, the, the short story of that. But, uh, then I started making the Red Pill movie, and a lot changed with that. Not only starting to hear men's issues and realizing all the ways that I have privilege as a woman, a white woman in today's society, um, but also seeing all the ways that men really are disadvantaged. Uh, How would you explain that, that you, the privilege that you have as a white woman? Because some people won't understand what you mean by that or will react yeah. against it. Uh, well, certainly if we had children, I, have, I would have a lot of uh, advantages there, especially if you're going through a divorce. Uh, but also social uh, reactions. If I were to, to take my kids to the playground alone, there's no real question about you know, me being on my phone or taking photos of them and, and walking alone with them. But if a man were to take his kids to the, to the park and be taking photos of them on his phone, there could be, and there have been, police calls on fathers doing that. Let's see, uh, in the dating world, there's a lot of advantages. Uh, you know, I mean, Warren Farrell maybe talked to you a bit about that, but that men still have the risk of um, approaching and, and hitting on women for the potential of a date, whereas women are have to say yes or no and, and get that privilege and, and I, when I started to think would I rather be in the position of having to approach someone for a potential relationship versus be approached, I would rather be approached and, and it, it does feel like the power position to just say yes or no. I mean if, you, if you're a royalty that would be the position you're sitting in, not trying to plead your case and show your resume. So I, I started to see uh, that men today really do have uh, a lot of issues that I never thought about before, whether they're rights or just societal um, kind of expectations on them. Obviously masculinity is, is a really gray area for a lot of people where they don't know what is good masculine anymore. We, we hear toxic put next to the word masculinity more than we hear good put next to masculinity or, or positive masculinity. So uh, I think guys have a really hard time right now. And, um, and even if I'm you know, in, in a workspace and I'm the only woman out of you know, 10 people, I, I do feel that power of that my voice is the female voice in the room. And um, you know, I, even making this film, the Red Pill movie, I was probably heard and listened to more because I was a woman making this film rather than a white man trying to make a film about men's rights. Um, so, you know, that's the culture that we're, we're living in today. And, and I'm grateful that, you know, my voice as a woman is valued and heard, certainly. And, uh, but yeah, I do see a lot of issues that men are facing. So, so when I started to understand the issues men face and apply it to my own relationship, I, I started to wonder what my at the time boyfriend was going through with uh, maybe sleeping five hours a night, working 11 or 12 hours a day in a laborious job, um, and paying the majority of the bills and having that responsibility that if we can't make rent, it's really on his shoulders to figure that out. Uh, so after making the Red Pill movie, it was the first time in my life that I switched gender roles with him, and not consciously, and not intentionally, but it just turned out that I had a lot more to do for work, and I was um, 
it, it made more sense for him to help me with my work than for him to work harder and me support him going to work. So we focused on my work and he became the, the homemaker type of gender role where he would take care of the dinners and do the cleaning and the laundry and dishes. And I, I noticed a lot of things that I hadn't seen before, such as I wouldn't notice when he did those kind of tasks around the house. And he would start saying, did you see I did the dishes? And I'd look around the kitchen like, oh yeah, oh thanks, okay. But the whole day I was focused on paying bills and getting the finances in order and it was really stressful. And I, I realized how much I hated being the provider. <laughs> um, I, I realized how hard it was to be the breadwinner and how stressful it was. And you know, you are thinking months ahead and what is the financial plan, whereas, uh, you know, back when I didn't have to worry about the finances, I was feeling underappreciated for, for cooking the dinners. Uh, but, you know, going to, into both roles, now I see that, that both really have um, a lot to be stressed about and worried about, and, and both really just want to be appreciated by the other and recognized for their contributions to the household. So long story short, I think moving forward for the genders and for relationships is really trying to understand how the other person is walking in their own shoes and what they're going through and the struggles they face and the stresses they have day to day and the contributions they do make. And you know, that's another thing is I've I now see so all the sacrifices that men make for our society, whether it's the road work and the power lines or the soldiers. You know, I have family members in the military and, and war makes me extremely uncomfortable, so I usually just choose to never think about it. But when I really do start to think about the way that they're putting their lives on the line for people they don't even know, but a country they believe in, it's really powerful. And it, it you know, when you really think about it, you can't help but get teary-eyed because it's, they are, they are doing so much for our society and for their families. And it just, you know, really saddens me that so many uh, men do go unappreciated. And, and I hate that women went underappreciated when they were, you know, the 50s housewife. Um, but I think we've changed positively in a new direction for women. And I would like to see that happen for men as well. Yeah, I guess for me, it's, that a space needs to be opened up that we we do listen to each other that and what you were doing with the with the film was showing there is another side to this and this is the same journey i guess that warren farrell went on that he was a big uh, player in the in the women's liberation movement in the 70s and then started at the same time setting up men's groups and saying and then the stories he heard in there kind of turned him on to, to realizing wow there are some stories that are not being heard men's issues with custody and wanted to be there for their children and not being allowed to be and all of these sort of things. And but it was when he was trying to bring those stories into into the what was then the, the women's movement and saying, look, there are these stories that are not being heard as well, suddenly they weren't interested. He was sort of pushed out. Um, so I guess for me it's like in, in any dysfunctional relationship, the only solution is to hear both sides of the story and have a dialogue between those two. Definitely. And, you know, I, I think when I was a feminist, uh, the fear was that if you start giving credit to the men's rights movement or men's issues, that somehow your issues are going to be put on the back burner or that you're no longer going to be cared about or, or funding is no longer going to come your way for resources. And that, that was a big fear of mine. Um, you know, I think there is some debate about whether or not this is a zero-sum game. A lot of people in the men's rights movement say it's not a zero-sum game. Compassion is not a zero-sum game. But then you can't make the argument that there, there is an allotted amount of finances towards uh, you know, any kind of social issue. And if we are going to care and talk about men's issues and try to find ways to help them, which may need a lot of funding, where is that money going to come from? So. It's not an, an easy thing, and I think there, that's why there is so much resistance to the men's rights argument is uh, fear over funding and, and time to care about these issues and airtime to talk about these issues. And, uh, 
and also when you start realizing that men have so many issues of their own, you can't really say it's, it's one group in entirety that's oppressed by the other group. And now we're talking about we're all in this together, we all have issues to care about. If, we're all, if we all have issues, is that going to just make them, like there's a tie. There is no game, there is no race, it's just a tie. And now are, are people not going to care about any of the issues? because there's not an enemy with a victor. Um, and it also, as Paul Elam has shown, that anger and polarization does drive people to, to cover the issues, and which is, which is quite, I guess, disappointing in a way for me, is that it, it does seem that it, it's a useful tactic to be able to drum up anger and response and reactivity, yeah. rather than creating a space for a genuine dialogue. Yeah, and, and especially with social media and, and everything at the moment. Yeah, and and the you know the best way to make a group organize and work together and have passion about their cause is to have a common enemy. So if men's rights activists are not the enemy of feminists, what is going to be the enemy? There needs to be something identified to keep that that machine running. Um, so maybe there is an, an enemy that we can find that is, that is preventing women from having equal rights. And, and I think that's the distinction that a lot of people need to look at when listening to feminist arguments. Is it equal rights or are they looking for ways women to have an advantage over men? Uh, like in family court, you know, do, do we want shared custody or, or a feminist group really fighting for primary custody for the mother in all cases? Uh, so if we're looking at equal rights and there's something preventing that from happening, let's identify what is that thing. But I don't think it's the men's rights movement preventing women from having equal rights. Uh, you know, as far as men's rights activists, what's preventing men's rights activists from having equal rights? Uh, you know, and, and there's a lot of de debate about could the word rights be used or is it just issues? Uh, but there are rights that are being denied uh, from men that women do have, at least in the U.S., with uh, genital integrity. You know, it is outlawed that a, a girl be circumcised, but boys, there is, there is no limitation or restriction on that. Um, DNA testing. Should you, as a person, have the right to know that you are a father or that the child is, in fact, yours, which are different storylines? to know you have a child, you know, there are many women who get pregnant, leave the state and never tell the father that he is in fact a father. Uh, so should that be a right? You know, we've, feminism never defined that as a right because they only looked at women's rights and that wasn't a part of the agenda. Uh, but I would consider that a human right to know that you're a parent, but only men have to deal with that problem. So. There are rights that are being denied for men, and who or what is preventing that from happening? I think men's rights activists do, do have a lot of um, valid points to make that feminism and the, the mainstream view of gender politics is really the feminist ideology, and they do have the most funding. They do have uh, you know a lot of people who become journalists or uh, university professors are feminists, are self-identifying feminists, or even self-identifying radical feminists. Uh, so those are positions of power in university, in the media, politicians. Um, so you know, I, I think men's rights activists may have a valid point to make about that. Cassie, thank you very much. Thank you. This film is part of a series from Rebel Wisdom on the subject of men and women including an interview with Warren Farrell. We used to have a battle of the sexes. That's been historical. Uh, but now we no longer have a battle of the sexes. We have a war in which only one side has shown up. And with Hannah Milling, the creator of the viral film From Women to Men. I am a woman who has been hurt by men. I'm a woman who has hurt men has hurt men.